Welcome to Crossbridge Church Online. We're so glad to have you here. If you're new here and you'd like to get connected, please go to our website and fill out our Connect card. There you can request prayer as well as information about membership, baptism, or get information about the church in general. Speaking of baptism, this weekend we celebrated our second all-campus ba beach baptism out at Key Biscayne, during which we welcomed more than 10 people into God's kingdom and our Crossbridge family. Uh, some of the names include Gabriel Hammond, Robert Kirkman, and Paolo Azumbuja over here at the Pinecrest campus. So let's pray and allow God to prepare our hearts today for worship. God, we love to give you praise and honor and glory, and we thank you for this time of worship that we get to join one another online, that we get to worship along with the band and, and sing songs unto you. We thank you for these amazing events that we get to have to connect people to Jesus, to connect people to the kingdom of God and the local church through Taste of Crossbridge, Be beach baptism, uh, local summer events, and all kinds of stuff that we get to do as a church, as your church, God. We pray you would, we would bring you glory and honor today in, in the worship and in God's word. In Jesus' name, amen. You loved my whole heart through 
morning. Let's lift up a prayer. We can believe this morning that God holds us in his hands. Amen. That the same God who holds the universe holds us in his palms. He knows our name. He knows every hair on our head. Let's sing that same God this morning. Let's sing, here I stand. So here I stand, high and slender. Yeah, sing it out, church. Hold my heart. So here I stand, high in surrender, I need you now. Hold my heart now and forever, my soul cries out. Once I was broken, but you loved my whole heart through. Sin has no hope. pieces broken and scattered in mercy gathered mended and whole empty handed but not forsaken I've been set free I've been set free oh, amazing Take our weakness, you set your chance. 
Well, church, as we move into a moment of giving, I want us to consider the joy that it is, the privilege that it is, to be a part of a family of churches. You know, one of the things that we get to experience is not just what happens at our campus, but what happens at the other campuses across this city. We've been celebrating also for the past year what God has been doing in our bridge network in Brazil as they've been celebrating what happens here in Miami. And today is a day of celebration because God is beginning a new work and officially today, Crossbridge Homestead launches. It's an incredible celebration. We cannot wait to see what God does there. In fact, today, over 60 people are joining the Crossbridge family as members at the launch service. You see, we celebrate together because one of the things that you may or may not be aware of is that as you give, there's a percentage of your gift that goes to what we call central, which helps make the family run together. We can take risks together. We can support one another. We can resource one another. We can be a part of what God is doing, not just at our campus, but across the family of churches. And so today we celebrate a new campus down in Homestead. And God is going to do amazing things there. And just yesterday, if you joined us, we just celebrated over 10 people. I think it was around 15 people that were baptized, that are making that declaration of what God has done in their heart, that he has transformed them, that they are raised to new life. Man, God is doing amazing things, church, through Crossbridge, through our bridge network in this city of Miami, and you get to participate in it. I was considering uh, this, these two verses in the book of Proverbs, and I want to read these to you as we prepare to give. And it says this, One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and the one who waters will himself be watered. You see, we have desired to follow God's leadership and to water fertile ground here in Miami to see the gospel go forth. We have sought to be a church that blesses others and blesses communities. And you have been a blessing through your engagement of time and talent and through your faithful giving of treasure. And you get to celebrate in that blessing. You are also being watered by the Holy Spirit as you are giving out. And so I pray today as, as across this family, we're all giving of our time, of our talent, and of our treasure, that you would just take joy and bring a, a smile to your face, that you are a part of something amazing that God is doing in this city, and there's much more to come. And so if you're giving today of your treasure, I want to encourage you to give in one of three ways. The first is that you can mail a check to your physical location. The second is that you can always go to our website, which is crossbridgefamily.com, click on your campus, and give there. And then if you attend Crossbridge Pinecrest or Brickell, you can give on the app as well. So let me pray for us as we celebrate and as we give today. God, we thank you for the privilege of giving, for this encouragement to us in your word that we grow all the more richer when we are generous. And that actually when we withhold, we suffer wants. When we celebrate today, your blessing in our life, the blessing that this church is to so many people. We celebrate a new campus being launched in Homestead. We celebrate new lives that are being transformed by the gospel that we were able to, to see and witness in the baptisms just yesterday. So we pray, God, for everything given, whether it's time or talent and treasure of finances, that you would use it for your glory and your glory alone. And that it might reveal to us your nature, which is one of bringing blessing and generosity to us. So give us joy today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Well, hey church, welcome to episode seven of our series, Love Works. And today we are discussing singleness. Now, just like I said last week for the topic of marriage, there is something for you regardless of your relationship status. God has a word for you. If you are single or dating, there is certainly a strong word here for you, a word of encouragement. And there is also a word for you here as well from God if you're married. Maybe it's deeper insight into your marriage, or maybe it is encouragement for how to care for and bring wisdom to your friends that are, in fact, single. And so I want to encourage you to enter into God's text today as we'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, ready to receive whatever God is going to say to you through the Holy Spirit who will apply His truths to your mind and your heart. You know, one of the things that's interesting about us as people, and I think this is true of all of us, is that we are obsessed with what is next. We are always thinking about what is next. When you're a child, you are asked this question, what do you want to be when you grow up? And then when you're in high school, everybody asks you the question, hey, where are you going to go to school? Where are you going to go to college? If you go to school and college or you're in a a specialty training, it's, hey, well, what kind of job do you want to have? What's your career path going to be? And then once you get into your job, the question becomes, well, what is the vision for your job? What goals do you want to achieve? What level do you want to reach? Where do you want to settle down? What city? What place? What do you want your life to look like? When you get married, everybody begins to ask, when are you going to have kids? And then later in life, you begin to consider, and people maybe ask as well, What's retirement going to look like? Where's that, where are you going to move to the mountains or to the beach? How are you going to function? We're obsessed with what is next. And you know that if you are single, everyone is constantly asking you, when are you going to get married? You want to get married? And you may be constantly thinking about what is next for you in your relationship status. When am I going to get married? And singles... They hear a lot of the same things, Christian singles in particular, and I wrote some of them down. If you're single, you know this. You've heard these things before. Here's some of the statements. There's someone out there for you. How are you still single? Jesus is your boyfriend. That's that's a hard one to even read. It happens when you don't expect it. Have you tried internet dating? You just need to pray about it more. Or you should try changing your profile picture. That's kind of offensive. Have you tried to talk to so-and-so? Or I know people who have gotten married at this age, which is an age older than you, as, as if that's some type of encouragement. And all of these kind of statements that singles here, and in particular, Christian singles here, are essentially saying that it's not okay to be single, that kind of the ultimate of life is being married. That you kind of haven't really started your life, you haven't begun your life until you've gotten married. So it's all these suggestions and helpful tips and encouragement, and one day it's going to come. But that's not helpful at all. In fact, in the church, we should be very careful and we need to be very mindful that our language and our posture and our position is not elevating marriage over singleness because the Bible does not do that. The Bible actually equalizes singleness and marriage. It calls singleness a gift. We're going to see that in our passage tonight in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And what makes this difficult for us is that the culture that we live in is putting idols before us that are attached to marriage and they're drawing us in to worship them and to believe them and to follow them. You see, we, especially here in Miami, we live in kind of this blend between two cultures. One is this Western individualistic culture that idolizes individual rights and happiness. 
And then we also are kind of experiencing this tension and pull and blending of traditional culture that idolizes the family. And so the way that this kind of fleshes out in marriage is that if you're being influenced by this Western individualistic culture, you can begin to think that marriage is going to be the very thing that will fulfill your desires. That marriage is going to finally make you happy. That marriage is really there for you, for your individual happiness. And so we even see the way that many singles operate because of this ideology. And it looks like this. I have to get my life stable and secure before I start seriously dating. I need to get to this place in my career. I need to be making this much money. I need to kind of have my patterns and rhythms of life set so that I can have somebody just attach themselves to my life. Because I don't really want to mess it up. I don't really want to alter it. I don't really want to sacrifice. I don't really want to compromise. I want to have my life. And if I find somebody that just wants to join that, then I'll know I found my partner, my spouse. Another thing that happens is you become extremely picky. Extremely picky. Because you're looking for someone to satisfy your desires, and so they kind of have to be almost perfect. You go on a second date, they say something, you think, that sounds kind of weird, maybe that's a red flag, I'm done, moving on, next person. You go on another date, they they believe something a little bit different from you about this issue or this idea, and you're like, I don't know if I could deal with that. And then, so you're done with that, you go on another date, their personality, can I, you know, can I kind of work with that? I don't know, so picky. Many people in our culture, they're not looking for a spouse They're waiting for science to advance so they can clone themselves. They're not looking for a spouse. They're looking for someone to fulfill their individual desires the way that they want to be fulfilled. So that pressure is on us, and we feel that. And then there's also the traditional culture that says that you are nothing until you are married. You are nothing until you are married and can begin to grow a family. And so you feel that pressure probably mounting on you as well as every year passes and you are not married or you're not seriously dating and you feel the pressure of that. You feel as if maybe my life has not actually started yet because I'm not married. Or you feel very anxious about your current relationship because it's got to work out because if it doesn't work out, what's next? What could happen? Some of you are really nervous when you have to go home to your family who maybe operates more in that traditional culture mindset because you know what's going to happen. They're going to say to you, hey, um, when are you going to settle down with a nice boy or girl? And you know what that really just feels like. They're saying, poor thing, you're not married yet. See, we feel that tension, that pull, right? in particular in Miami, of those two cultures clashing and and pulling against one another. So you feel in your singleness as if maybe I haven't really started my life and I feel like I'm nothing if I'm not married, but I also feel like I need marriage to kind of fulfill my desires. And and I have all of these standards and I need to find somebody that's going to fit that perfectly because I don't want to adjust my life for that person. It creates for many a place of hopelessness and fear. It's a difficult relationship status to be in. But see, Christianity is astoundingly different than any of these cultures. Christianity says this about marriage. We talked about this last week in episode 6. as so We looked into the book of Ephesians, the letter to the church in Ephesus, chapter 5, where the Apostle Paul says that marriage is not about self-fulfillment, it's about service. And we also know, as Christians, that marriage will never satisfy all of your desires. That role is reserved for Christ himself. Christianity is astoundingly different. And singleness for the Christian is a viable pathway for adult life. It is not less than being married. Marriage and singleness 
are equalized. And so the question that we're going to consider tonight, which is maybe a question that you've never thought of before, and that is this. What is the biblical theology of singleness? Does the Bible have a theology of singleness? Yes, it does. We see that in our passage tonight. The Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth, and in chapter 7, he talks to married people and to single people. In verse 27 through 29, he says this, are you married? Do not seek a divorce. Are you unmarried? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life. And I want to spare you from this. What I mean, brothers, is that the time is short. Now, when you read this the first time, it kind of sounds like Paul's having a bad day. <laughs> he says, if you're not married, if you're unmarried, don't look for a spouse. If you're not married, if you're single, do not fret, do not look for a spouse. And if you are married, you haven't sinned. You're like, wait, what? I mean, I wasn't considering that I had sinned if I am married. What is he saying? If you're not married, don't try to get married. If you are married, you haven't sinned. But I want to spare you, the Apostle Paul says, from the troubles of marriage. Now, this is a very different thought process than what maybe you feel and what culture says. Because you feel like, I want to be spared from singleness and the troubles of singleness. I'll take the troubles of marriage. The Apostle Paul says that he wants to spare you from the troubles of marriage. What is he saying? Well, look at verse 29. He says this, What I mean, brothers, is that the time is short. The time is short. Well, what time is he talking about? He's speaking about time from God's perspective. Meaning, he's speaking, as we're going to see in the following verses, about the kingdom of God. God from time's time from God's perspective as he is bringing the kingdom of God to its fulfillment, to its fullness. That the kingdom is now, it is here, but it is not yet. And we live in the tension of that time. Look at the next few verses. It's very interesting. And out of context, these verses are very confusing. It says this in the second half of verse 29 through 31. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they had none. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. For this world, in its present form, is passing away. You see, the Jewish understanding of the Messiah, of the Savior, was that the Savior was going to come once in power. And when the Savior arrived in power, He would establish the kingdom of God, the new world, once and for all. And God's people, who have been historically oppressed, would be free. There would be victory. There would be no more suffering. That old world would pass away and God would establish His new world for His people. And this is why so many Jews during Jesus' day and still today struggled to believe that Jesus could be the Messiah because He did not arrive in that fashion. And He did not bring the kingdom of God in that way. At least yet. You see, we believe that the Savior has come twice. Well, he's come once, He's going to come again. The first time, the Savior, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, came in weakness and humility. Why? He came to establish the kingdom of God now. And we are invited to be a part of that kingdom through faith in His death and His resurrection. 
But Jesus speaks all the time about the kingdom of God. He says the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is now. But we also know and we believe that Jesus will return, that he will come again. And when he comes that second time, he comes in power. And he comes to bring the kingdom of God to its fulfillment, to usher in the fullness of the kingdom of God. To once and for all do away with that old world. But see, we live in the now, but not yet. We live in the now, but the not yet. We live in between those periods of when Jesus came the first time in weakness and humility to establish the kingdom of God and when Jesus will return in power to usher in the kingdom in fullness. We live in here. Which means we live now where the kingdom of God is at hand and the Spirit is working to transform lives and to bring healing. And we are to pray, as Jesus says, that the kingdom of God would come down. But we also live with the old world still very much at hand. We face and struggle with the broken systems and relationships and power struggles of our world because the old world is still very much here. And we engage in that old world as well. We marry and we buy and sell things and we use products for leisure and pleasure and we, we want to be happy and we do mourn. You see, that is what the Apostle Paul is saying here. Because you read it and it's really confusing. He says here that as you live in the now but the not yet, you need to consider the way in which you are meant to live. He uses these extreme examples of if you're happy, don't seek to be happy. If you're mourn, don't mourn. Well, what's he saying? He's saying as you live in the now, you're to live with a not yet mindset. You're to live with a future mindset. That you should actually be obsessed about the future, but the, the ultimate future. Not the future of five years or ten years or twenty years. Your eternal future. That we are to think about what is next, but we should be thinking about what is ultimately next. And that this should influence the way in which we live. So he speaks about different aspects of that in our verses. And so if you have money, if you have wealth, that's great. Steward it well. But don't think that that's what life is all about. And if you don't have money, don't lose hope and despair. God will provide and, and you are awaiting eternal wealth. Mourn. It's okay to mourn. In fact, we're called to mourn with those who mourn. But don't overdo it where you act as if you don't have any hope. You are awaiting the day where your tears will be wiped away. Seek to be happy and enjoy life. But don't think that that's what life is all about is trying to manufacture happiness for yourself at any cost. Because there is a day where you will experience joy that you cannot even fathom. See, this kingdom theology, the Apostle Paul is applying to marriage and singleness. He's applying this kingdom theology to marriage and singleness because he's helping you to, to point forward and to say, there is an ultimate wedding. There is an ultimate feast and party in fact there's even an ultimate family that is eternally yours through faith in christ have a mindset with that hold on to that allow that to guide you you see all of the desires that you have that fuel your hope to be married to be accepted to feel loved, respected. All of those desires will one day ultimately be fulfilled. 
they will one day ultimately be fulfilled. And what is next? That future eternal next. And so as we live in the now, but the not yet, we need to make sure that we get things in their proper place. You see, marriage is a foretaste of what is next. But it is not the ultimate. It is not everything. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 talks about that. He actually makes that comparison between Christ and the church. But marriage is not ultimate. It is a taste of what is ahead. And it in fact points to what is to come. That's what Ephesians 5 is all about. That, your, that a marriage between a man and a woman points to the ultimate marriage that is between Christ and the church. And so if you are married, the Apostle Paul is saying here, stay married. Enjoy your marriage. But don't think it's ultimate. And don't speak to other people that are married, that are not married, as if it is ultimate. Because it's not. And if you're single, don't despair as if life hasn't started. Hold on to hope. God's timing is perfect. And your desires are fulfilled ultimately in Christ. He's essentially boiling it down to this. Don't live like only this life, this physical life matters. Because there, one, there is one to come. There is one to come. So, if you are not married, that is not a negative reflection upon you. It's not a negative reflection upon you at all. Because biblically speaking, singleness and marriage are equalized. You may not feel that way in our culture, but in God's eyes and in God's world, as we live in the tension between the now but the not yet, it's equalized. It's not a negative reflection upon you. The Apostle Paul actually says that, that singleness is a gift. That's why he, t- he tells the single people to not seek to find a spouse. And if you're married, he says, stay married. Both statuses, both realities have dignity and honor and uniqueness to them. I think that's why the Apostle Paul says this in verse 17. He says, nevertheless, each one should retain the place in life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. So if you're married, you are called to your spouse. Listen, If you are single, you have been called to singleness. Now, there's some like, "Ah, don't don't put that on me. That's a tough pill to swallow, but I think it's because there's a misunderstanding a lot of times of what that means to be called to singleness. You see, for marriage, it's easier to understand because when you go up to that altar and you make those vows with your spouse, You are making those vows till death do you part. And as the Apostle Paul says, you should not seek a divorce. It is a lasting, permanent calling to one another. But the difference with singleness is that singleness may not be a permanent calling. That singleness is a calling with stages. It has stages to it. One stage is a permanent stage. There are people that are called to be permanently single. And there is great honor, and there is great respect, and there is great dignity in this calling. Because to be single is not to be less than those that are married. It is not. And you are in very good company if you have been called to be single. The Apostle Paul himself was single. That's why he says, I wish that you were single as I am. The perfect human, Jesus Christ himself was single. Didn't need a partner. In fact, what was able, what carried him through was the anticipation 
of that ultimate wedding feast between Christ and His church. You are in good company if you have been called to be permanently single. And there is respect and honor deserving of that calling. Another stage is the processing stage. This is the stage where you are single, but you are dating. And you should be dating with an eye towards whether or not this person is the the person that God wants you to marry. It's a processing, it's an evaluation stage when you're dating. And then the third stage is the prowling stage. No, I'm just joking. (laughs) I'm just joking. The first stage is a permanent stage. The second stage is processing. And the third stage is pouring out. A stage where you are pouring out. To kind of understand this, I want to look at verse 32 through 34. The Apostle Paul says this, I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. You see, it's possible to make an idol out of a friend. It doesn't happen a lot, but it's possible to make an idol out of a friend, to value a friendship so much that you sacrifice your calling that God has given you, your calling to Christ, the interests of God to sacrifice those for a friend. But it is much easier to sacrifice your calling for a spouse, to have divided interests. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying here. To be married is to struggle with those divided interests between God's calling and his vision and and his ideas for your life and for your marriage to struggle with the tension of that and then also the tension, as he says, to please your wife or your husband, to please your spouse. See, if you're married, you know that tension where you struggle with caring more about the world's affairs instead of the Lord's affairs because you know that some of these world's affairs will please your spouse. Making this type of money, enabling these type of opportunities, these vacations, this type of home, this carved out time with just the family where work doesn't invade, whatever it may be. And none of these things are wrong to pursue or to seek after, but it is so easy to have divided interests, to justify the culture of your family and the interests of your marriage that may not be surrendered and aligned to God's because you're pleasing one another. And so you need correction. You need challenge. You need to be brought back. It is easy to have divided interests and to put God's affairs and His ideas on the side, and focus on pleasing your spouse. It's easy to do that. And I want to say this too. Singles. It is also easy to fall into the trap of idolizing your future husband or wife that you may have not even met. In the same way as when you're married, it can be easy to idolize your spouse and to do whatever you can to try to please them, even if it is putting God's affairs on the side, it is easy to do the same thing when you are single, to idolize a future husband or wife that you have not met. To have that be the filter through which you see everything. You look at your career, not as... God's affairs, that you're to surrender your work to God and see what he can do in, his, in your work for his name and his glory, but you see your work as an opportunity to establish yourself as an attractive partner because of your success or your income. You look at your social life as a way to strategically meet somebody or to go have fun experiences that you can document so then you can use those pictures on your social media or on dating apps. 
You may see your social media now as an opportunity to reach out to share who you are and connect with friends and even use it as an opportunity to testify to the glory of God, but as a billboard for your availability. You may even have your mental space consumed with the thought of getting married or the fear of not being married where your interests are divided between the world's affairs and God's affairs. I want to say this. I want you just to consider this question. Idolizing a future spouse that you may not have even met yet when God in His perfect timing does bring that person to you, how do you think your marriage will function if you've been idolizing even before they arrived? If you've had divided interest even before they arrived? If you sacrificed God's calling and vision for you even before they arrived? I could tell you kind of how it's going to go. You're going to find that person. You're going to be excited, and and that's great. You're going to get married, and then you're going to realize that marriage is way different than you thought. It's going to be hard. That person that you've been idolizing and you've been waiting for and you're so excited about is going to fail you, is going to hurt you. And then it's going to throw everything off. I thought marriage was going to be this. I thought I was going to fulfill these desires. I thought I was going to feel like my life had started and I was going to be complete. And now... This is breaking down. I never saw this. I never imagined this. And I'm not okay with this. And there's going to be a big blow up. And then you're going to think, I need to get my life back on track. I need to get this relationship back on track. We need to move this marriage forward. So then you're going to begin to consider what are the things that you need to do to please them so that things can get better and happy. And then the cycle continues. And now you're just consumed with pleasing your spouse. And they're consumed with pleasing you. And God is just pushed farther and farther out of the equation. These are some of the troubles of marriage the Apostle Paul is speaking about. Maybe that's why he says this in verse 8. He says, Now to the unmarried and the widows I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I am. Because of those divided interests. So I want to say this. Don't believe the ideology of Western individualistic culture or traditional culture. Don't believe that you're nothing without a spouse. That you're nothing if you're not married. That's not true. It's not true at all. Because that will lead you to compromise things. To compromise your values for pleasure. To rush a dating relationship because of fear. To be fake in a dating relationship because you just don't want to lose that relationship because you just have to be married because you're nothing if you're not married. Don't believe that. And don't believe that Marriage is about fulfilling your desires and that you will never be happy until you reach that place. Because then you will enter into that relationship idolizing what it can bring to you. And when it fails you, it will throw everything up and you may even be entering in with a trap door in your mind. And if things don't go well and they don't work out the way that I want and I don't feel satisfied and happy in the way that I imagined, then there's an escape door. Don't idolize marriage. Rather, pour into your calling as single in whatever stage you're in. If you're permanent, if you're processing, or if you're pouring into, give yourself to that stage to that calling and i want to suggest three ways that you can do that the first is in your calling to be single for this season or if it's permanent pour into your friends pour into your friends develop intimacy in your relationship deepen intentionality in your relationship so that your friendships will carry forward with you when God brings you a spouse, if that's His will. Pour into your friends. Secondly, pour into the family of God. Pour into the family of God. Cultivate service in your life. 
Seek to discover what your spiritual gifts are and the way that God wants to use you in his church. Celebrate what God is doing in his church and cement his vision for you and for his church in your life so that when God brings you a spouse, that that doesn't get thrown to the wayside. That's already been cultivated and cemented in your life so that you may protect against divided interests. And then lastly, pour into Christ. Pour into Christ. Establish a kingdom mindset in your life. Enhance spiritual disciplines in your life. Deepen your prayer life and the consistency at which you interact with God's word and you come and celebrate what God is doing in his church. Pour into Christ. Do not waste your singleness. Pour into your friends. Pour into the family of God that is the church and pour into Christ. Listen, singleness is a God-ordained means of displaying the gospel. Singleness is a God-ordained means of displaying the gospel because in your singleness, when you walk into it and live it out right in the way that God intended, guess what it reveals to the world? Guess what it testifies to the world? The sufficiency and supremacy of Christ. When you don't seek to live in despair and fear and hopelessness and you don't buy into the to the lie that you're nothing if you're not married and you don't view marriage as the very thing that will make you happy and fulfill your desires and that you see that God has called you to this stage for this time it reveals the supremacy and the sufficiency of Christ that Jesus is enough that your faith gives you vision, that prayer is powerful, that yes, you can delight in your salvation, that the family of God is actually a place where you can have real friendship that is meaningful. It is evangelistic, your singleness. It testifies to the supremacy and to the sufficiency of Christ. My prayer is that you that are single, that you would seek to not have divided interests while you are single. That you would focus on the Lord's affairs, on God's affairs, and not listen to the lie that the devil himself, the deceiver, is speaking into your ear because I know that he's speaking it to you. It's the same lie that he told Eve in the garden. When Eve is in the garden, the serpent comes up and the devil, the deceiver, says to her, what's, what's happening here? He said, I... Eve says, we can't eat of this tree. If we eat of this tree, we'll surely die. And what does Satan say? What does the devil say? You will not surely die, for your eyes will be opened. Serpent says to Eve, the deceiver, essentially this. If you follow God, you'll never be happy. You're missing out. Your eyes right now are not open." Because you're listening to God. And he says the same thing to you. He says the same thing to you in your singleness. That if you follow God in your singleness and view it as a calling and view it as, as a way to, to testify to the sufficiency and supremacy of Christ and that you pour into your friends and your family, of, uh, which is the church, and you pour your life into Christ, you're not going to be happy. Don't listen to that lie. Testify to who Christ is. Be secure that this is a God-ordained means of displaying the gospel to others and to deepening it in your own life. Pour out into your friends, to the church, and into Christ. Don't waste your singleness. It's my prayer for you. Will you pray with me? God, we waste a lot of time on a lot of things. We have divided interests. We have fears and anxieties that captivate our mind and our heart. Those of us that are married may see marriage as the ultimate or maybe have failed to see 
the way that it is a foretaste of, of what is to come. Or we have not viewed it as something that is lasting and permanent and needs to be cultivated. We have not surrendered our marriage to your vision and your affairs. We have been focused on our affairs. Would you challenge us and encourage us and give us a vision for our marriages and for those of us that are single? Holy Spirit, breathe peace into these hearts. Strength and hope and vision and excitement to live out this calling because it is not less than. God, there is such a great testimony to someone who walks in their singleness as a calling to declare You, Christ, as enough, as sufficient and supreme. Give boldness to live this way to those that are single in our church. We thank You for who You are and Your patience with us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.